everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's class. It's good to have you here. Um, good evening for most of you. Um, if you're overseas, good morning or good ridiculously early morning, depending on what it might be for you. Uh, Jeff Gibby here. I'm going going to basically uh, read a legal disclaimer and talk a little bit about our guest and get out of the way. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, today's demonstration is designed to instruct you on using Metastock and the accompanying software plugins. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell, but rather guidelines to interpreting and using specific indicators and features within the software. The information, software, and techniques presented today should only be used by investors who are aware of the risk inherent in trading. Metastock shall have no liability for any investment decisions based on the use of their software, any trading strategies, or any information provided in connection with the company. I try to say that just a little bit differently every time I do it, um, so it doesn't become too monotonous. I've probably said that about 600 times by now. We have a very special guest, somebody we haven't had in the room for a while, um, Jeff Fish. Um, I remember, uh, you know, Jeff and I, I think we were talking, it might have been like June or May or April of last year, and we helped him kind of, that's a very good strategies towards um, intraday trading and look at kind of those type of things, and very, very intelligent guy. Um, helped him kind of organize his thoughts into into an indicators into meta stock and um, just very, just very much a, a bright guy somebody you should listen to somebody that has if you're interested in that kind of intermediate to swing term trading this is somebody you'd want to be paying attention to so uh, with that being said uh, I'm going to um, Jeff did you get through that audio wizard I did uh, I guess you guys that didn't hear me um, answering all those difficult questions um, but yeah, I guess. Yeah. Good, awesome. Well, it's good to have you here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you and um, let you get underway. Uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing this screen. Is there anything in particular you'd like to mention while we're getting started? Uh, no, thanks for the uh, for that nice introduction. You just saved me a nice uh, saved me a slide, and um, I'll just get started. And uh, if you have anything you want uh, me to cover in particular as I'm going through, feel free to ask me uh, any questions or point me in that direction. And that goes uh, for everyone else as well. Uh, as I'm going through this, I will try and keep an eye on the, um, the questions box or the chat. Uh, but we will also have time at the end to ask any questions that you want. Um, before I uh, get officially started, however, let me just make sure that you can see what I think you can see. Um, I can go to the preview mode, I suppose, but um, can you see the uh, title slide here, Swing Trade Consistently with Market Phases? Okay, great. Um, and again, before I get dive into the material, I did see some of the poll questions that were up there, but um, let me just get a quick sense of who we have here in the audience. And my first question is, how many of you are familiar with marketgauge.com? Uh, that happens to be uh, the company that uh, I co-founded, and that's where I'm talking from. Um, so I just want to know if you're familiar. And my next question is that, uh, and Henry, yes, welcome Henry. I uh, always suspect when I see Henry that it might be Henry from Sweden. Pleasure to have you in here. And so Henry, you've heard of phases. I know you have because um, you're familiar with market gauge. Has anyone, anyone else here know what I mean by market phases? Um, okay. All right. So some of you do and most of you don't. Well, all of you are going to um, understand it uh, thoroughly by the time we are done here. And um, and that's my objective, really, for this webinar, that, that you really walk away from here understanding what we mean by market phases 
and uh, really being able to, to take this and apply it. And I got some help for you at the end um, to, to further your education, and it's not even going to cost you anything. So this is a bit of a different uh, type of a webinar for me. And, and honestly, um, I, I usually do this webinar in conjunction with uh, Mish, who's our swing trader here at Market Gauge. Uh, but tonight, uh, I'm going to do it all by myself, so it is going to be a little different than when than when she does it. Jeff already did a really good job of basically tell, telling you I've been uh, trading for a whole bunch of years, and um, I, I started actually as a floor trader. Uh, I really do love swing trading as well, and most of what we're going to focus on here tonight is swing trading. So in this webinar, uh, there are a few things I really want you to, to walk away from. I want you to be able to look at a trend or look at a chart and be able to identify when the best time to enter that trade is or enter that trend. And I also want you to be able to look at a chart, consider a trade, and not have the first thing that goes through your mind the I can't take this trade home because I'm worried about it gapping against me. All right. And finally, if you're in the market at the right time, right, if you can find the right place to get into the market, then you'll know where your stop is. You won't be a afraid of the stop. All right. It'll be a part of your routine. But all of this for the for the purposes of tonight's uh, webinar, really focuses on having confidence in what we mean by the power of market phases. Now, market phases are, I think, literally what they sound like. They are, or we uh, coined this frame, phrase, market phases, to be able to give you the sense of really understanding what the condition of the market is at any particular time. Now hopefully my pen is going to work here just to help me out. And it does. Okay, so phases are like cycles, right? They they go from a one condition to the next. So in a in a perfect market, uh, which which there is never a perfect uh, transition from each one of these in exactly this order, but in a perfect market, the market would go from a bullish phase to then a warning, and then after a warning is distribution. So as you may suspect, a warning means that the strong bullish trend may be ending. The distribution means that it's definitely ending. A bearish phase means we are going down. A recovery phase means we might be starting to come up, right? The early bulls are beginning to show up. Accumulation phase means the bulls are really starting to show up in full force. It's an early bullish uh, indication. And then finally, you're back at the bullish phase. Now, what a lot of traders don't realize is that some of the best times to get into a trend are in between these phases or it transitions from bullish to warning or transition from accumulation to bullish if you read a, a you know the typical books on how to trade and how to read the markets Oftentimes, one of the first things that you'll learn as a, as a beginner trader, and I don't think this is wrong, I just think that there's a next step, and hopefully this is the next step for you. So one of the first things you'll learn is wait for the market to really be bullish, and then that's when it's all good and safe to get in the water. Now, in some trading strategies, that's true, all right, but in a lot of trading strategies and in really tactical swing trading we have found that the the best times are in the transitions and the reason for that is because you often have your tightest risk and you often get the most explosive immediate moves right it's when the market shifts that it tends to expand and exhibit the trend that you want it to exhibit. Now, in order to really do this, though, 
you have to be prepared to be looking for the transition, not necessarily looking for when everything is in, in perfect gear. And so what do I mean by transition? What do I mean by perfect gear? And how do we determine what these phases are anyway? So the way we determine phases is very straightforward. And because of the time frame of this webinar, I'm not going to be able to go through all six of the phases, but I will give you uh, examples of uh, various ones, and we are going to focus on the most obvious ones, the bullish and the bearish, and the transition from the bullish to the warning and the bearish um, up to the recovery. So the formula, not to scare anyone off with uh, thinking that this is going to be a mathematical uh, seminar, it's not, but the, the formula here is that the phase is determined by the position and the slope of the 50 and the 200 day moving average along with where the price is. Okay, so what we look at are 50 day moving average and 200 day moving average the simple, not the exponential, that's a common question. We look at where they are relative to one another, and we look for what the slope is uh, on each of them, and then finally we look at where the price is relative to both the 50 and the 200. So if we were to define the bullish phase, which is the most basic phase, and uh, the probably the most uh, powerful in terms of short-term swing trading, trading in that um, quote-unquote safe environment. It's not always the most dynamic phase, but it's the easiest one for most traders to get their hands around. So if we're going to define the bullish phase, we simply want the 50-day moving average over the 200-day moving average and we want them both sloped up. Okay, so sloped up just means they look like this, one over the other with the 50 over the 200, and we want the price to be over the 50. All right, it doesn't get any better than that in terms of defining your phase, or in terms of defining your bullish phase. The price is above the 50, the 50 is above the 200, and they're all going up. All right, everything's going your way if you're a bull. As I said, it's one of the easiest ones to get your hands around, um, and it's probably one of the first uh, patterns or conditions you learn about when you read the basic uh, books. Now, the bearish phase is just the opposite. All right, you'd have the 200-day the pointing down, you'd have the 50-day pointing down, and you'd have your price underneath both. So that's the bearish phase. As simple as this can seem, it's incredibly powerful. All right, and then when you layer in what's a warning phase and what's a distribution phase and what's a recovery phase and what's an accumulation phase, you get a whole bunch of different opportunities to catch the market when it's transitioning from one condition to the next. All right, but before we get there, let's just take a look at some charts. Now the idea of really understanding phases is one, to make sure you really understand that the, the condition of the market. All right? And I think today in the markets is probably a pretty good example of where phases, even though we may not be at a, a critical point in terms of the phases, they help you keep things in perspective. And I say that because the market's been going up as we, um, and we'll see a chart in a second, the market's been going up uh, pretty steadily for quite some time now, but today we had a down day. And it's really easy to look at a day when the Dow's down, I don't know, 100 or 150, um, and think, oh man, the market is really, this is, in a, market's really in a bad spot. Or maybe you'd look at the uh, IWM, so Russell 2000, and say, man, this is the second day, this is, this is really terrible. Right? But if, you, if you're confident in what the phases are really telling you, then you'd sit back on a day like t today, and you wouldn't be thinking that the market's necessarily um, in big trouble. Right? You know that you've got to have down days, and they're down days in the context of what's still a bullish phase, and we'll get to that in a second. But 
I go I go off to the tan on the tangent of what today ha what happens today because if we if we apply that to what's happened in the past, the application is that it's not always okay for the market to be going down and having a big down day. If we look at 2007, right? So here's the beginning of 2008. And what we're looking at here is just a basic, uh, it's, it was a candlestick chart, but it's been compressed so that I could get enough um, time on the chart. The red line is the 50-day moving average. The black line is the 200-day. Okay, and I know someone's going to ask, so I'm going to tell you that the, the little green there is the 10-day, and we'll get to that. But, um, if you're paying attention closely, I haven't said anything about the 10-day in terms of it defining the phase, right? It doesn't. 10-day doesn't have anything to do with the phase. It's the 50 and the 200 and where the price is relative to it, All right? So 2007, 2008. Argue, arguably um, the worst bear market that we've seen in a generation. And if you were just focused on the phases, you really understood or you really knew the trouble that the market was in. And if you were tempted to try and pick a bottom, you would do it in a very methodical way or you wouldn't do it at all. And nobody likes to sit through a 50% haircut in the market. Um, but if you understand that eventually the market will tell you when it's ready to come back, then you can, all right? And to me, it's really important that as a trader, you really understand where you are in the context of the bigger picture. So if we look at 2007, and the 50 again is the red line, and the 200 is the, is the black line, when do we go into an all-out bearish phase for the first time? Right here. Okay, now... We didn't catch the top if we were waiting for a bearish phase by any stretch of the imagination, right? But if you were just focused on, I don't want to be long if I'm in a strong bear phase, I'll wait until we get into a bullish phase before I really consider a, it to be a strong market you would have sat through patiently this whole decline, you know, the majority of the decline. All right now, the nimble trader, and I'll we'll get into this when we uh, look at actual trades. The nimble trader would have focused on the short side or staying out of the long side um, all through this initial decline, and then may have gotten aggressive on the long side as we get a transition here into a recovery phase All right now at this point you can start nibbling and at that point you had some opportunity on the long side if you really wanted to um, probe on the long side in a horrendous looking market but keep in mind when it got up to the 200 which would have been a transition into another phase it fails. And when does it enter back into the bearish phase? Right about the same level, a little higher than where you came out of the all-out decline bearish phase. So once you get into that situation again, it's straight down. And you really don't have a whole lot of opportunities, maybe in there, to try and be a nimble trader and, and change things. But the slope never really changes. And it keeps you out of trouble. All right? Now, a lot of times the argument for this is, yeah, well, but by the time it turns around, it's too late to make any money. Well, that's entirely wrong, right? We're not just going to wait for everything to line up. We're going to focus on patterns that occur around these transition of phases. But how aggressive you're going to be and when you want to focus on them is definitely determined 
by where the bigger picture is. So let's take a look at how the transition of this market went from the depths of the worst bear market into what has now become an incredible uh, bull market. All right, this is the spies down here trading at 70. All right, the transition from a complete bear phase into a recovery phase in here happens around 80. Again, if you wanted to probe on the long side, and we're going to see how you do it on the trade, you could have been doing it in here and then out right here. You could have been doing it right here. And then, well, when you get out, it's going to depend on your trade. But clearly, the risk that looks like this is well rewarded when you start nibbling on the long side down there if you want to. Now let's just say that you didn't want to be that aggressive, right? You wanted to wait for things to really turn around and be much more defined as having more market strength than trying to pick a bottom. This, in my estimation, is one definition of trying to pick a bottom. Now, when you understand how phases and the transition of phases work, you can do that, all right? But that is my definition of trying to pick a bottom, not trying to find this down here, not trying to find this, all right? And now, I'm not saying you can't, but that's not what this is about. This, this webinar is about swing trading in environments that are easy, all right? Not trying to catch a falling knife and understanding how to do that because you understand transitions in market phases. But my first point here is that you, you're not going to catch the very bottom. You don't need to catch the very bottom. There's a lot of money to be made even if it's between here and the next point that you know is going to be a problem which is the 200 and there. Right? And after you get through that point, the other, another transition is looking at the market here and then looking at the market here at the pullback and, and transitions of 50s. And then even better, I mean, this is absolutely beautiful. Doesn't break down into um, the next level of phase here. And then gaps with enth almost enthusiasm into what would become a bull phase. All right. So here's my point. If the very low of the market is down here around 68 and you're getting in around 90, or I shouldn't say getting in, this is when you're starting to focus on tr really trying to make money on the long side. Remember where this thing broke down from in the prior screen, all right? 145. So 65, 68 to 90 might seem like a long way to wait before you can really focus uh, on strong longs, but it's not that far when you consider that we've come all the way down from 145 or 150 and the high closer to 160. All right, and it's, it's certainly not all that long when you consider where we are today. All right, so hopefully you, you get my, my point here, which is that we're waiting for the right time. We're patient. We're looking for the market to come back into a positive transition to the next level of phase, all right? Whether that next level of phase, if you're aggressive, is the recovery uh, phase down here, whether it's the accumulation phase down here, or it's the resumption of a bull phase right here. And if we watch now, once you're in a bull phase, the big opportunities, the easier opportunities, and I think for, for most traders, the most fun opportunities are when you start finding transitions from warning phase back to bull phase, pullbacks in other words, to pullbacks in the bull market, which since 2009 have really been a, a gold mine in terms of opportunities. All right. The key, however, is understanding how to play those pullbacks, how to play those transitions. And we'll look at those in terms of the trades. All right. So let's just take a look at how the market has then traded from these lows. And I, what I want you to do, I'm using the spies here, but we could, we could be using 
any stock we could be using any indexes and in a minute I'm going to show you how to put this together with a bunch of other indexes to really get a sense of where the whole market is headed at any particular time but when you're looking at phases I want you to notice that the, again the red line is a 50 the black line is a 200 and they're both more or less sloped up the majority of the time all right the 200 relentless uh, to the upside all right so when you got a really strong 200 you're going to look for transitions back up above the 50 now the warning phase is when you get when you break down from the 50 now a stronger warning phase would happen in an environment where the 50 is starting to look weaker it's starting to roll over right but stronger warning phase doesn't always mean that you're going to go lower it just means you want to be really sure that it's getting back over that 50 before you um, expect it to break right it's a little bit of a nuance uh, but the key here is not that you're going to expect that every time it comes down to the 50 that it's going to stop there but instead you're going to let the market tell you when it's done breaking the 50 and it's ready to continue to go back higher All right so what too many traders do is they just assume that when the market comes comes down to the 50 day moving average like it did here that it's just going to rock it back up or it's or it's going to hold and then as soon as it doesn't hold they assume that it's got to continue to fall so that's not that'll drive you crazy that will absolutely drive you crazy instead look at the market in terms of when it's above and let's I'm just picking any particular point here when it's when it's above the, the 50 and it's in a bullish phase here right everything's going its way all is good it's it's inevitably gonna pull back and it's gonna test the strength of that bullish phase and it's okay if it breaks the bullish phase what you want to wait for if you want to trade it from the long side is for the resumption of the bullish phase back over the 50 not assume that just because it's near the 50 it's going to hold you're going to wait for short-term price patterns that indicate that it's either done breaking the 50 it's beginning to resume its trend over the 50 or it's in fact going to hold the 50 all right combine those two things with the understanding that the best time or um, one of the one of the best times to be doing this is when your 50 is over your 200 and your 200 is strong all right and you can see if you take the point of view that when it comes back over the 50 you've got room to run here tight risk here room to run here consolidation finally comes back up room to run here slices right through it you never should have even been thinking about it from the long side really um, in terms of bullish phase trading until you got back over here room to run right here a little chopped I know because it happened to me here fine and in fact I know because it happened to me and in fact using this very thing I was able to get in here and I don't know where I finally um, took profits I think it was in here but there was a lot of room to run okay a lot of room to run so the key is really understanding why you're getting in and understanding how to limit your risk around these key inflection points now another way to use these phases is and this is an incredibly powerful way to look at the market and it's somewhat of a tangent um, to the trades that I'm going to show you but it's it's just so powerful that 
I felt like I had to at least include it in this webinar. And that is, if you take a look at the markets and look at them this way, with what I call the, the, the four market watch indexes, or the same thing, it's a, the, the major indexes, whatever you want to call it. But what you want to do is make sure that all of them, the SPIs, the Qs, the Dow, and the IWMs are all in alignment with one another. All right, that doesn't mean they all have to be in a bullish phase, but they're all doing the same thing. Either they're transitioning or they're holding, but they're, they're all acting in either a bullish way or a bearish way in their respective phase. Now this is where it becomes important to understand what we mean by a transition or um, just the phase condition. So that you can look at them and say, so let's take today for example, and this is, this is as of today. You can look at them and have some perspective in terms of how you should be trading. So the spies, here's the, remember, 50 is the red line, spies well into a bullish phase, right? Strong 50, strong 200. Qs, strong 50, strong 200. Dow, strong 50, strong 200. IWM, 50 coming back, but really close to the 200. And not coincidentally, having trouble getting over an old swing high. All right, so that said, we're in a really strong bullish phase. Even if this market pulls back, even if the Qs pull back uh, 5 or 6%, basically, certainly 5%, they're still going to be in a bullish phase. The SPIs can pull back, you know, another, where are we, 196. They could pull all the way back down to 192. So that's another, what, 3% still going to be in a strong bullish phase. Even the IWMs can pull back another 2 or 3% here, and it's still going to be in a bullish phase. All right, so if this goes back to what I was saying about trying to pick a bottom, trying to pick a top. If you, if you as a trader, and I don't, I don't want to be accusing anyone, but if you as a trader want to uh, try to pick a top, and say that that's it, the market's done here, I should sell everything, then understand that you're picking a top in a very strong bullish phase. Now, it could turn out to be a, uh, a top, but picking tops or picking bottoms, as we saw in 2008, is an incredibly difficult and dangerous thing to do. So today's sell-off, it was a sell-off that if you're that if you're a bull, you probably didn't want to see if your longs are getting clipped. But if you're a bull looking for an opportunity to get in, then today was a good thing. And probably some more days like today will be a good thing for the trader who knows how to get in when things are going to turn around and move back higher. All right, so if you understand phases, you can look at the market in that way. It's not always going to be that way and hopefully when the opportunities really jump out at you, you'll see them if you're focused on the markets like this. And so here's an example. I mean I could pick numerous places um, but let's let's just focus first on say the April time frame, right? So spies break down, they're in a warning phase. Dow breaks down there in a warning phase, but still well above the 200. The, um, the Qs, they've broken down in a much stronger way, right? This is, the, this is not the first time they've, they've broken down. They're, mu they're much weaker in terms of their phase than the Dow or the Spies, but still over the, over the 200. IWMs, on the other hand, have really broken down, right? They're not far from their 200 at all. So 
if you add this all up, right, before anything happens next, when the spies break back to the upside, what happens in the rest of them? The Qs don't break to the upside, the Dow does, but IWM is nowhere near, okay? So I look at that scenario and I say, if I want to be long the market, then the strongest one here is the SPIES. However, it may be the strongest and it may be in a bullish phase, but aside from the Dow, the other two, and certainly the broadest measure of the, of the market, IWMs, is nowhere near that. So, so should I expect that the SPIES are just going to take off like they have so many times before in recent months or recent years? No, I shouldn't. Everything's not necessarily in sync. Is it a bad thing here? Not necessarily because at the same time the IWMs are holding their 200. All right, so they're, they haven't broken down into more of a distribution phase. They're still in the warning phase. And the Qs still in a warning phase too, so they could bounce. I would just expect, which is what happened, that if they get back up to a flat to negatively sloped 50, it might be a little bit more difficult to get through that. So if you're to apply this in a practical way, if you had to pick the times that you really wanted to push on the longs, would you pick the times when everything's transitioning into a strong position all at the same time? Uh, SPY, so if we look now fast forward to the beginning of June, when IWMs now are now back in a bullish phase, Qs are, are bullish, SPIES are bullish, Dow is bullish. This transition here is a much stronger transition than, say, the SPIES trying to pull the other three or the other two up. All right? So just to, you know, put some perspective on it, I want it to be long. I didn't think the markets were done. All right, but I have to admit, based on the analysis that I just did, buying the spies in here seemed a bit risky. All right, but if I had to buy anything, I would buy the spies. So that's what I bought at that time. However, when the spies, are, everything was already strong, as I just pointed out in June, I bought the IWMs. Why? Well, it was kind of a catch-up play, but the, the key here was everything's in gear, and if this is going to be a good transition back into a bullish phase, this is a transition back into the bullish phase when the other three are already in bullish phases and on their way. This is a transition into a bullish phase where it's trying to pull up something that's not, two things that are not. This transition was a rough ride. This transition was instant gratification. All right, so you see how if you look at the market phases in terms of all four indexes at the same time, it's an incredibly powerful way to really get a good understanding of what the market's doing. I have another example of that. So here's an example, and here's where we are right now. Now, the other way to look at this that, that's really important, which I started to say, is that we're in an extended bullish phase. It can, it can drop quite a bit and still be in a relatively strong position. Now, if it drops quite a bit, what am I going to look for? I'm going to look for the, for the bullish phase to hold and then resume. I'm not going to just assume that it's going to hold and hope that it bounces. So let's look at um, a different point in time. All right, same idea. I'm going to go a little faster this time. All right, so in this case, the spies break down 
into a warning phase. The warning phase is when you're trading under the 50-day moving average, but the 50 is above the 200. All right, it's a warning. If you want to be, sh if you want to um, get aggressive on the shorts, you can. If you want to get rid of your longs, this is a good time to get rid of your longs. Why is it a good time to get rid of your longs? Because if it turns around and turns right back into a bullish phase, you haven't really missed much. All right. On the other hand, if it turns out that you're right, you've gotten out early in a lot of cases. Okay. Spies unable. To, to get through their 50-day moving average. At the same time, the Qs are trying to break their 200. They're much weaker, right? What's this telling you? Is this, as I was saying before, a bullish phase that you should be anticipating, or should we be anticipating that the warning phase probably going to resume to the downside, especially if the Qs don't shape up? All right, they got a long way to go to be back into a condition where everybody's really in agreement. So the point here is that when the Qs break the 200 and when the spies pull back off the 50, they're essentially doing the same thing. It's just that the Qs are doing it a lot worse. All right, and you can see that the same thing's going on here with the Dow. It's breaking its 200. Russell it's breaking its 200, All right? So there's a situation where you want to get out of the way of this market. You don't necessarily want to expect it to hold. When can you start to look to get back in? Look at this pattern in here where all four of them, basically at the same time, are transitioning back above the 50-day moving average. The Qs are a little weaker in terms of the 50 still under the 200, but they're all doing the same thing, right? So if here you had a big heads up that the market was weak, then here you had a huge heads up that the market was set up nicely for a big move. That happens to be in the beginning of 2013, and most of you probably remember that 2013 was an incredible year. Now, I'm not saying that this particular pattern is always going to lead to the best year in, in 10 or whatever 2013 was, but you can see how the market had transitioned from bull phase down all the way into a distribution phase. It had plenty of time to digest. and if you're paying attention to these signs, the market's telling you that it's in a much different position. All right, It's in a much different position, even though the price, for all intents and purposes here, is the same price. All right, Here, maybe you're a little higher. Here, actually a little lower. Maybe higher if you wait till that. But most traders, look at moving averages and they say they lag. They're no good. They do lag. I'm not going to say they don't lag. They can't not lag. We're talking about 50-day average, which means that's the, the average of the, the price 50 days ago. All right, It's going to lag. But if you understand how to read it as a phase and look at the short-term patterns around the transitions, then you can find incredible opportunities in terms of timing what's going to happen next. All right, so Mish isn't here, um, but she has a service that focuses um, to a large part on identifying patterns around the phases. And you know, one of our best examples, um, or, or I would say all of our best examples, uh, revolve around the fact that uh, traders who work with us have gotten to get this um, particular approach to market to work for them. And so this is just an example of a, of a quote that we have from one of our customers who literally is, is saying and has done, is taking over his accounts uh, from a financial advisor. And he's, he's able to do it because he's applied the phases to basically a, uh, a select group of asset classes so that he can trade the general moves in the market based on phases better than his advisor could do. 
he really came to the conclusion that, hey, I'm doing a better job than this guy using the phases. I'm, can do, I'm going to do it myself. So how does this translate into specific trades? All right, so now the 10 isn't all going to be important on all the charts, but it is going to be on all the charts. And, and one of the ways in which you time your way into phase transitions is looking at where you are relative to the 10-day moving average. But before I get into this, does anybody have any questions um, about how I'm defining the phases, what I'm really looking for in terms of the phases? All right. Because now we're going to talk about trades. And, and all these examples that I'm giving you, these are trades that either Mish did for her service, or uh, some of them I did myself and didn't have anything to do, um, or they weren't recommended by Mish in her services. So I'm not just picking these out and saying, hey, look, this is you could have done it here, and you could have sold here. We did. All right, and so here's why. So this happens to be one of the, the trades that, that Mish put on, and she uh, got in around $68, um, got in around it, but it's actually not here, sorry, it was on the 18th, I have, I have notes here, I circled the wrong thing. And she's, she's in on the 18th based on the test of the phase and the resumption. Okay, she, and she's in at a price of around 68.30. And while it's beyond the scope of this particular webinar, we're going to set our stops based on the stock's ATR, average true range. In other words, we're going to look at the stock's volatility and look to keep a, depending on whether it's a mini swing or a larger swing trade, we're going to look to identify situations where you can find a stop where the stop would change the phase or change the short-term pattern and be uh, relatively close to one ATR if it's a strong, I mean, if it's a, a longer-term swing trade. You might go to one and a half, um, you might even go to two if you're looking for a bigger move. The importance there is that we're also going to set targets and we're going to trade to targets. So the way you're going to swing trade and sleep at night and not worry about the gaps is that you're going to take profits along the way. So if Mish is a buyer in here, she's taking profits, and I can tell you just based on the math of the formula, it's either going to be in here or in here, and she has a final profit target that happened to be up on this big red day here. So the definition of a swing trade that takes advantage of these corrections isn't always, hey, I get in at the retracement to the 50 and then I just wait. No, it's you get in, you tactically take your profits, move up your stop to no loss, and then if the, stock has, if the stock's in a gap against you to a loss, it's really got to have a huge gap. And we're not going to stick generally, Mish never, generally will not stick through earnings reports. So the risk of a gap is somewhat contained. There's news risk. There's always news risk. But the biggest risks for gaps are earnings related. All right. So if you don't trade into earnings and you take your profits uh, relatively quickly and your prof first profit target is in line with what your risk is and your risk includes a short-term pattern around a phase transition, you're setting yourself up for trades that look like this. Relatively uh, quick target one, and then a nice move to a target two or target three, and you're done. All right. Now you can let it you can let it run further if you want, but the easiest way to do this is to trade to targets kind of one, two, three, and you're done. Now the reason that I'm pounding this home is that too many traders will will say, well, if I'm going to buy it because it retraced to the 50, then I'm going to use my trailing stop as the 50. All right now, that's, that's great 
if you can afford to do that and the trade works out that way. But having that as the general plan is not going to work. All right, you can't use a lagging indicator to get in and a lagging indicator to get out and expect that over time that's going to make money. All right. Yes, you are going to take profits along the way, but you're going to take them at um, pre-calculated intervals. All right. So that's an example. That, that's one example. I'm going to go through a few. Now, the key here, and I, and I said this earlier, is that the most dynamic times to get into um, swing trades using the phases is when they are in and around a phase change. All right, so in this case, USO, crude oil, is moving up from a bear phase, so this is a 200, this is a 50. It's just moving out of that bear phase. And I probably should have put the bigger picture chart here, but I wanted to um, blow it up. If you're a buyer in here, here's a plan. I'm a buyer in here because I've now moved, I have a confirmed recovery phase here, and the belief is that we're not going to come back, back below the 50-day and go back into a bearish phase. If we do, we're out, all right? But if if we don't, if the market doesn't go there, then this is a transition where it's one of those transitions that you look back on as a trader and you say, you know, why didn't I see that bottom happening, all right? Well, the chances are you, the reason you didn't see it happening is because you weren't really looking for it in a defined way. We've defined it. We made a transition, we have a short-term pattern, we have clear risk, we're going to take our um, profits as we move up, and we're going to exit based on our rules, and the rules have to do, in depending on the trailing stop, with how far we've gone up, and where we are relative to prior day key reference points, all right? and targets. So if you reach a particular target, so this one didn't hit the target up here, all right? Mish got out on this particular day when it broke down below the 10, and my guess is it probably also broke down below um, uh, R1, sorry, S1. Uh, okay, George, I misread your question when I glanced at it earlier, and it's a good one. And, and George's question, why take profits along the way if conditions are unchanged? Um, I misread it, but I think I answered it as I should have. You want to take profits along the way at targets because it's been our experience doing this for, in my case, uh, almost 25 years now, 24, and uh, Mish and my co-partner Keith doing it for you know another 10 years beyond that, so 30, 35 years. That while while it sounds great to say I'm going to buy it here and I'm just going to ride it until it rolls over, if you do that with the whole position. I guarantee that 99% of the traders out there, maybe you're different, 99% of the traders will not be able to trade that position correctly with an entire position, all right? You will trade your position in a much more systematic way if you take some off, and I would suggest that you do it in three tranches, okay? So you take a third off, now, or you could do it a half and then a quarter and a quarter. But you wanna take a, uh, an initial profit that essentially enables you to lock your position into a quote unquote no risk. When I say no risk, I mean you can set your stop to where you bought it or really close and that you have moved away from that entry price at least a full average day's range, preferably one and a half or two average day's range. So why is that important? It gets back to being able to sleep at night. Stocks gap all the time, but most of the gaps are less 
than an average day's range. All right. It feels really bad when it happens and it happens against you. But the truth is that it's it's generally not that bad. So if you've already taken money out of the trade and the stock gaps against you, it's not going to feel nearly as bad. You're not going to panic out of it. You're going to have your rules that you're not that you're going to get out below certain key reference points. All right. We happen to use the opening range. That's a topic for a whole other webinar. We happen to use the, the opening range to help us not panic out of stocks that have gapped against us. And that means being able to sit there for the first half hour of the day. There are days where I don't even look at the market for the first half hour of the day and I might have 10 positions on. And the reason is because I know that I don't want to get out of those positions for the first 30 minutes. All right. So and and also in fairness most of the time when that's the, the the condition all my positions are in a position where I've already taken profits out of them. All right? That way I can trade totally um systematically. So it's really important in my opinion to take profits out at targets. You'll trade better and you'll stay in the trades longer, much longer. You'll make a lot more money trading a smaller tail for a longer trend than you will trying to hold a longer a bigger position for that same amount of time because most traders like I said you might be different but most traders and we've dealt with literally thousands will not be able to trade with a full position that way so I really it's a really good question George and I really feel strongly that most traders would improve their trading by coming up with a system of trading to targets we know it traders have, have told us this uh, that that's their experience and sometimes it's hard and it's really hard in, in bull markets like the ones that that we've seen because you sell it and it keeps going up and if and for a lot of people that's just as bad as taking a loss. It shouldn't be. Let's take a look at another trade. One of the definitions of a resumption of a bull phase is a close above the um, back above the moving average and then a move over that high or two closes above the moving average. Right. So those are two rules that, that we use to be able to say uh, in a more definitive way, not a, a just a subjective way, hey, this has now resumed its bullish phase. It's time for me to get in. So it's not just, hey, it came back up above the 50, time to get back in. No, we want to see it close there, move higher, or we want to see two closes above it. Okay, now it's time to get back in. So here's an example where that happened uh, with Wells Fargo. Mish did this trade. I did this trade uh, myself. Part of this trade that I did here, I'm still in. Uh, so I do take um, trades and hold them for, you know, as you put it, George, until the conditions have uh, changed. Um, so you're in, you're in here, and she f exited the last part of the trade up here again because it was targets. Now, so here's an example. Wells Fargo uh, has gone much higher, went much higher after this. Okay, but this is the plan. The plan is. Bull phase, tested in a warning phase, resumption of the bull phase, quick hit. All right, 5% in three weeks, do it over and over and over. All right, it's a, it's a reliable pattern that repeats. Okay. A key to this also, like I said, don't do it into earnings. Now, it works on the short side, too, although the short side is much tougher um, in an environment like we've had right now, so we're not focused on the shorts. But here's how it would work on the short. Here's a 50-day moving average again, right, in red. Couldn't resume its bullish phase, breaks down. Couldn't get back up to it, it breaks down. Rallies back up, looks like it's going to try and test it and go back to its bull phase but right back down into a warning phase all right warning phase this also happens at a point where the markets are weak so it makes more sense warning phase entry on the next day why because you can put a really good stop above this level 
profits. She took profits on this particular day, three days down. Did she take profits because um, she knew it was going to be a low? No, she took profits because she got one HER. She got her average range. All right. As it turns out, the next day, stock um, moves higher, takes out R1, and she exits the trade. All right. So she's in. The prices happen to be 69, um, 69.28, 69.30 level. Takes a profit down uh, one ATR, and then gets out. Exits the whole thing at 68.45. So all you know the the exits, both exits are profitable, but not hugely profitable. And it could have easily, if it hadn't, if it had gapped up. She'd be looking to get out at a no loss. All right, it's not wait to see. Um, it's not wait to see if it's going to go my way. It's take my profits. After you take your first profit target, you are not taking a loss if you can help it on the rest of that trade. Now here's IBB. Um, and this this happens to be one that. I've traded. Um, I happen to be, you know, really focused on it because it was one of the hotter um, ETFs in uh, 2013. So, with that in mind, it pulls back to the 200. It confirms a, a back into a recovery phase over the 200 again. Two closes. I'm in. I'm actually in. After it closes and breaks that high, I'm in. My stop is below the low of that day. Okay, my target is about one and a half to two times that risk. When this bar starts to go lower, I'm at my target. I take some profits. It comes all the way back, and I actually sold a little bit lower than my entry price but I sold. They flushed me out here. All right. They flushed me out here because that's the that's the game. Right? The game is that when I'm right, it keeps going. Sometimes they're gonna get me. It's frustrating, but that's the way that one went. Now, I waited patiently because there really wasn't a good I prefer and Mish is a little different. You could have, with what we um, what we do in terms of short-term patterns, could have taken this opportunity against the 200-day as well. But it would have been tough buying it up here in that gap in all this trouble. This happens to be the first real big test of the 200, and the first time is always the best time. Um, and then you wait for consolidation and look for a pattern like this was beautiful in here. Right, so this should start to look familiar. You got your 50 coming down on the 200, but over the 200 negatively sloped. All right, could be better, but closes above it, also closing above this um, stuff. Now you got two closes, you're good to go, either in here or on the gap, and your stop down here. All right. Now I actually didn't like the fact that I was buying in here. So I only bought half of what I would normally buy. When it proved itself out, I bought the other half in here. I sold some because of targets here, and I literally sold the, the, uh, the rest of it today. Had we not broken down here, I would have ridden this, George, getting back to your question. My my plan for riding this was to ride it until it clearly broke the 10-day uh, moving average. All right. Today I just didn't want to see it come all the way all the way back. All right. I just wanted to take uh, profits in general. And if you're really below this 10-day moving average, um, then that's my my uncle point on this particular uh, trade. If I were to get lucky, all right, and it were to keep going, and uh, just 
enable me to hang into it and the 50 day comes up and catches up then I might move my stop down to the 50 if I really want to stay in it for a long time that's what I mean by you can stay into trades longer if they do go your way but if they don't I trail the stops up so the question was, how is the target set for Wells Fargo? The targets, um, and I'll get to those in, in just a second. I got a few more chart examples, and I'll give you some some more solid rules on the targets. So it doesn't always work, all right. And here's another one. I did this one. This wasn't uh, Mish. It's one I just got out of the other day. Um, I'm not really surprised that it didn't work, um, but that said. This whole consolidation in here just looks like it can turn. And I, I haven't given up on it yet, but the pattern's not there. The pattern that was there, though, was a nice, strong break of the 200. So I got in it on this day, again, after it closed above the 200, and I got in it the next day. I took some profits here again now it happened to be because I was at my profit level and it broke this level and came back down through it so I took my profits again I'm not I, I did it because I knew that if I took the profits I wouldn't worry when it pulled back here I wouldn't worry when it pulled back here and when it finally broke down and broke through this level which was just below my entry point again I wasn't happy about it but I'm not taking a big loss. I'm just giving up, uh, and it's basically a scratch um, because I took my profits. All right, now, plenty of times, I will have to ride a stock all the way down to almost where I bought it and be comfortable with that only to see it turn around and go my way. I wouldn't do that if I rode the whole thing up and the whole thing back down. So it didn't work. Now, when would I consider this again? If it goes back up and comes back above here, I'm not going to take it. All right. When it when it did it here, it was taking out a a lot of work. If it does it here, I don't. I still feel like it's got a lot of resistance in here. All right. So this one isn't. It's just not set up as well anymore. Um, but just like the IBB. If it consolidates and then gives me a pattern that's a transitional pattern, then I'll probably try it again, all right? Because now this consolidation will be even longer. And hopefully, what would be even better is if this 50 gets back above the 200, and then I'll buy, be buying a transition into a bullish phase and not just a, a transition where it's it's not a strong bullish phase, just an accumulation phase with a 50. Um, significantly below the 200 all right it was weak all right so george not to pick on you but your question again i said is a good one and here's an example of one of just holding on so eem all right the the eem uh another etf global etf emerging markets and this is a slightly different pattern um, and a way to use the 10-day moving average. So when does this thing turn into a real bullish phase? Technically, right here, right? But we can see it coming. We can see it coming right there. And we can see that correction back down here. So I want to be in in the bullish phase. I use the recovery of the 10-day moving average. So here's a correction back down to one of the phase levels, and then a recovery back above the 10 as my entry point right here. My stop is if that recovery doesn't work. I see that I could have a good target at that level here, which would be in line with a, about twice what I'm risking, which would be also in line with about two ATRs, which is a good level for a country. Um, 
and all those things add up I wound up taking profits up here just because it kept going um, and I'm still in it now here's an example where this is just this is just one that I'd like to be able to hold as long as it seems to really hang in there how does it really hang in there well the 50 is now really accelerated my entry point is here the 50 when we got this swing here the 50 was basically at my entry point so it's at this point where I can say you know what I'm not going to use the 10 I'm actually going to see if I can wait till the 50 and with any luck this will keep going and going and going and I'll have a relatively small position but I can tell you my experience has been that I've made more money on that last little small position that I wasn't worried about than I do trying to take bigger positions and make the money quickly so t please t learn how to take the profits now in terms of targets and I'm pretty much wrapping up here I know I'm going a little over in terms of targets there are some basic uh, rules when we're talking about swing trades and most of the trades I've been pointing out here are swing meaning uh, our definition of swing would be that you're going to try to have your risk equal to about one maybe one and a half average true ranges which means your initial target about one and a half to two ATRs and a second target three to four ATRs and a third target trailing or sorry a third exit trailing now you don't have to have the third exit um, you can do variations of it um, and we do get you know there are we do get more specific than that but that's the general guideline all right if you do that you don't have to be right more than half the time and if you and if you do that and let those tails run you can get trades that are 10 or 15 ATRs that's a 10 or 15 times what your initial risk was now it might take a couple months I'm not saying you're gonna get it in three weeks but you can get them all right you can get them for a couple reasons you're getting in at phase transition points all right it means you can that means two things you can get a really good stop at a really tight risk relative to how far it can go so let's just take the EEM you know I haven't even done this yet I have thought this through but my entry I think was around 4160 all right which if you think about it I remember I felt like I was paying way up for this thing but my perspective was this is a transition from a test of what is going to become a bullish phase if I'm right so I'm getting in at the bullish phase early would I have preferred to have bought it down here sure but I really I didn't have a pattern there to buy it okay here once it transitions over this 10 like this it really shouldn't come down below here so let's call it under 41 in fact I remember thinking under the round number 41 I'm buying it at 4160 ATR is probably 30 cents at that time it's two ATRs worth the risk what's two ATRs gonna buy me what's another 60 cents gonna buy me well this is 4250 it's about a, a dollar away so if I get just over those highs I'm gonna get my risk all right and I'm gonna get my risk where if it breaks that I'm in here the bull phase has started here and if you look at the bigger chart of this it looks like it could go much higher so now I risked 60 cents it's trading 44 I'm in at 41 60 did I say running up to 4450 so I'm in for what two and a half dollars on 60 cents worth of risk uh, I'm, I'm almost you know at five times my risk all right and it certainly wouldn't take much 
for this thing to go another two and a half dollars, and then I'm closer to almost 10 times my risk. I don't think it's going to happen in two weeks, and you know what? It could come down and you know stop me out below the 50. Actually, my stop would probably be below this swing and below the 50. But it's just an example of how now I can let a really wide stop trail up. All right. So the key here, and this is this is actually a really good example um, of that. I didn't plan it that way, but the way I explained it, I think worked out. Is the key here is that we're applying short-term patterns to and the risk parameters to these phase changes. All right. I wanted, uh, from time point of view, and just for what I could uh, uh, really hopefully get uh, through to you, I wanted to focus on the importance of doing this in the context of the phases. So I hope that that's been helpful. Now, if you have any questions, I would uh, I'm open to take them, and. Um, I'll, I'll stay for, I won't say as long as you, as you want, but I'm certainly willing to answer any questions you have. In the meantime, um, I don't have anything to, to sell here. Um, I, in fact, I have something quite the opposite. We, have, uh, we happen to be doing this webinar at the same time that we're doing a, um, a series of promotional uh, videos and training. And so you can find that at this link marketgage.com metastock forward slash phases. So the first thing you'll get if you go there is this ebook, How to Swing Trade for Profit. And that is going to explain the phases. It's going to explain how to use ATR to um, set your stops. It's also going to explain um, the concept of short-term patterns around this uh, the concept of phases. So it's a great start. You're also going to get a video as soon as you um, get that, and that video is about the phases. Um, what I just showed you right here is a lot more in-depth, but there are two more videos coming, and there's more information uh, from Mish as well. So if what you saw in this webinar is helpful or interesting, there's about five times as much coming your way in in uh, in the next week or so but you got to go to marketgage.com uh, forward slash metastock forward slash phases and Jeff I don't know if I can type that in here I didn't ask you if I could type that in so people could click on it they're not going to be able to click on it on the screen but I figured that everybody should be able to spell metastock and phases um, that's what we've been talking about All right, so does anybody have any uh, questions? Uh, great, thanks, Jeff. So Jeff just put the link in there, so you can uh, just click on the link and go straight there. Um, one of one of the, uh, the the questions that we often get is, uh, and I tried to address it, is I don't want to hold overnight because I don't want to um, I don't want the gap risk. So the uh, the the most important thing in dealing with gap risk is understanding that you can't control whether or not a stock is going to gap against you. But you can control how much you're risking. And not only can you control how much you initially risk, but you can control when you take some of that risk off the table. And you also can control how much risk you take relative to what is normal for the stock's volatility. And that's one of the reasons that the volatility is so important, okay? I like to use the example of Google um, because I think most traders can relate to the fact that Google um, 
at the price that it's at, um, you know, eight, nine hundred, almost near a thousand dollars at at times. You can't trade a, a six or an eight hundred dollar stock and put in a fifty cent stop. You wouldn't do that. All right. You can't trade Ford, which normally trades like fifteen to twenty cents in a range a day, and put in a dollar stop. It doesn't make any sense, right? So why is it that most traders don't take that obvious logic and apply it to how much risk they take on a stock? Now, if I told you that this stock has very, very little chance of ever gapping down more than a dollar. It would be highly unusual for this stock to gap down more than a dollar. And then I told you, set your stop so that if it gaps down a dollar, it's not going to matter to you. You're not going to lose a lot of sleep. All right, you're not trying to make all your money in one day. So don't buy so much that you have to make all, that, that you, that you think you'll make all your money in one day because you bought so much stock. Instead, buy a level of stock that you're comfortable sleeping with and do it at the right time and you'll be surprised at how it can grow when you, are, you have a methodical approach to swing trading and you're able to sleep with the risk. It's kind of like my EEM example at the end. The thing on average trades 30 cents a day. All right, but I'm up 250 on it. I won't be surprised if I'm up five or six dollars on it in another month or two. Quite frankly, right now the markets kind of look like they want to pull back, and if they do, there's a good chance I'll get stopped out of this thing. But you know what? I've said that about a lot of stocks. I said that about Boeing, which I think I bought at 80. I had it all the way up to 140, and I held it through earnings and got clocked on the earnings, but you know, I, I sold it after the earnings. I was still selling it. I, I couldn't believe how long I held that thing. It was because it was a small position and I did exactly what I, what I pointed out with EEM. I moved up my stops to logical levels that you would normally think of being just unreasonably wide stops, but it doesn't matter because it's a small tail. I, you know what, here's, a, here's a, a f one final point that has to go to this. I have um, more than once in the last year made over $1,000 on a 25 share position as a tail. Now, if I told you, and I'm not talking about Goog either, right? I'm talking about stocks whose average ranges are were not that high and that last tail of the, just that 25 shares that I just really just let it run and see what happens over a thousand dollars most people don't believe it it's the power of being able to hold something so trade in a way that's in control and in alignment with the volatility of the stock and you have rules that enable you to follow these phases and they're incredibly powerful. I don't care if they lag, they don't lag the way we use them and if you want to learn how to do this, um, there's really no one better out there to do it than, uh, than Mish and uh, she's doing this, um, like I said, we're in the middle of this uh, presentation of free training for the next week. This webinar happened to be great uh, timing. Um, so we lucked out there, and the first step is to get uh, this book and see that first video. So I hope this was helpful, and I'm going to wrap it up with that unless anybody uh, has some questions. Thanks, you, Henry, for coming. Always, uh, I know you've, uh, you're intimately familiar with the uh, phases because you've been in our uh, webinars before. Uh, I don't usually present them like this, so I hope that was a little bit different uh, for you and for everybody else um, who attended this webinar. You now have the benefit of um, being able to attend a webinar by Mish in the, in the future, and I guarantee it will be uh, different but more of the same.
So without any questions, I think I will um, wrap it up. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you for Metastock for having me. All right, so one last uh, time before I before it gets taken down, if you uh, want to learn more about this, marketgage.com forward slash metastock forward slash phases.